Well, welcome back, 613 Golfers, to another episode of 613 Golfer Podcast. I am, as always, your host, Jeff Botter, publisher of Flagstick Golf Magazine. This week's episode is presented to you by Ping Golf Canada and the all-new G425 family of golf clubs from Ping. Now that we've got golf pro shops and retailers opening up, get into those shops and, and, uh, and retailers and test out or, or take a look in person at some of the new G425 lineup from Ping. If you can't, make sure that you visit ca.ping.com and uh, check, it all, all, check it all out online. Well, um, exciting week has passed between uh, this show and the last show had a great episode uh, last week with uh, my good friends and uh, and partners in crime here at Flagsticks uh, Scott McLeod and Joe McLean a fairly lengthy podcast I will uh, I will admit and and uh, judging from the number of of YouTube views and I don't usually like to draw too much attention to how many views we get but we're always trying to get more um Probably, probably a little long for most people to sit and watch, but uh, judging from the podcast downloads on uh, Spotify and Apple Podcasts, uh, um, pretty significant amount uh, of audio downloads. So obviously, it's a lot easier to sit and listen to uh, that particular type of show than to watch it. But it was a great episode, and if you hadn't had a chance to to watch it or listen to it, make sure you go to flagstick.com and check it out. It is our 25th anniversary. There's some really cool stories that we told there. And that's not the end of the stories. Trust me, we got a whole season of this going on. So there's going to be a little, little something we're going to do with respect to road trips. We didn't really dig too much into it um, in the last podcast. And uh, Scott and I have taken a ton of road trips um, to various destinations. And there are far more stories to tell than the ones that were shared on that last podcast. So um, great that uh, those that listened to it uh, and watched it, but we must move on. Now, those of you that don't like humidity, right now is probably not your favorite time to be out golfing, but judging from the tee sheets that I've seen and the discussions with golf courses throughout the region, uh, humidity doesn't seem to be stopping too many people. The tee sheets are full. Everybody's getting out and enjoying golf. And that's a great thing. Uh, another great thing announcement was obviously made that patios are going to be opening up and not just a golf course, this patios period are going to be opening up. So people are going to get a chance to get out and enjoy some patio time. Um, but good for the golf courses that, uh, you know, after your round of golf, you don't have to necessarily leave right away. You can go and chill on the patio, have a bite to eat, have a beverage, uh, chat about the round with, uh, with people, stay your socially distant, wear your masks, follow the rules and stuff to keep this thing going for us. We're getting near the end. I feel it. I think everybody else can feel it too. But um, one thing I would say is rather than uh, rather than complain about the fact that uh, we're not quite at phase two yet, that we're just entering phase one, let's just take a look at the fact that things are trending in the right direction on all counts for, for us, particularly in this region. And uh, I think things will open up a little earlier than people expect. We might get into phase two a little bit earlier, but we should be happy that we're getting where we're going uh, the way we're getting there. Let's just uh, keep trucking along. Now, with the with the better weather, with golf courses being opened up, um, tournament season has finally arrived. And for us at Flagstick, this is a very exciting time of the year for us because once the tournaments start happening, even though there's a little bit more limitation in how we cover these events, we're still able to go out and, you know, take pictures and be at the events. And it's very exciting for, for Scott and for Joe and a little bit myself. I don't do a lot of the events anymore myself, but uh, it's nice to get out and see people, watch some golf, do some interviews, things like that. So first up on the docket uh, this year, uh, on June 14th at Eagle Creek Golf Course, the Ken Venturi designed Eagle Creek Golf Course, but out in Dunrobin is the first event on the flagstick.com Ottawa PGA or PGA of Ottawa uh, tour and that's the spring open presented by uh, Cobra Puma Golf. Last year there was no winner crowned but the 2019 winner of that event was Bill Minkhorst and Bill will obviously be the defending champion and he's there to defend his title but also our very own Scott McLeod has uh, entered the senior uh, division ranks for this event so all eyes are on Scott to see if he as he crosses over from the regular division into the senior division to see how, uh, how he fares among, amongst the senior big boys. And, and one of those guys is Graham Gunn. So uh, he's got his hands full there. So good luck to everybody um, on June 14th. And uh, in particular to our, to our good buddy, uh, Scott McLeod. Um, the OVGA obviously has have some events coming up too. The OVGA's two-person scramble, uh, which also features a men's, women's and mixed category is happening June 18th uh, at the Meadows Golf Club. A uh, great little 36-hole track over on Hawthorne Road here in Ottawa. 
Um, that's the first event, uh, field day, June 18th, uh, as well at the Castleview Golf Club, uh, which will also act as a qualifier for the uh, match play and for the Alexander Tunis. Uh, obviously, the, the Tunis has a, the ladder system through Golf Quebec, but there's also qualifying uh, that's done at various events, and field days are usually uh, scores that are counted towards qualifying for that event. So that'll be happening on June 18th, and the junior city and districts will be happening June 19th and 20th right now. Um, Equinel is the confirmed first uh, course location. Uh, they haven't confirmed the second course location, but that will be done in short order and the, the second round will take place somewhere. I guarantee there'll be a second round. So that's that's awesome uh, to get that stuff going. The Play Junior Golf Tour, uh, which obviously we announced earlier in the year that we're, uh, we've become an official media partner with, uh, they're finally going to get to kick their season off after some delays and postponements. Um, their first event is June 29th at the Upper Canada Golf Club, and that'll be followed very quickly on uh, on July the 5th uh, at Smith Falls Golf Club. And um, my understanding is there's still some space available, at least in the Smith Falls event. Um, but for other events, uh, you don't have to join the tour to participate in Play Junior Golf Tour events. You just have to sign up for the various events. You can do that at uh, pjgtour.com um, for a little bit more information on the race to the uh, One Capital Cup. So that's on the uh, Play Junior Golf Tour. So um, some great news uh, that these things are happening. The tournaments are starting to happen. It's, uh, it's really exciting, like I said, for us when these events start happening. Um, but it's great for the golfers. And as school season starts to wind down, junior golfers are going to be looking for all those tournaments. And it's, uh, it's going to be a, a really good summer. I, I really think so. Now, milestones in the golf industry are, uh, are, are commonplace. There's a lot of golf courses. In the Flagstick region, there's at least 165 different golf courses throughout our region, which spans uh, Deep River, Belleville, Hawkesbury, Cornwall, you know, to the Montreal or to the Quebec border that way. Some of the golf courses on the Udaway side uh, of, uh, of the 613 on the other side of the Ottawa River, also part of the Flagstick territory. Um, but uh, Gananoque the Golf Club this year is celebrating 100 years. Now, 100 years is a significant milestone for any facility. And I don't know if anybody's played the Gananoque Golf Club. It's a nine-hole golf course down in Gananoque. Um, it's not a particularly long track uh, as far as uh, overall, uh, you know, length of holes and overall length of the golf course. But uh, old school golf course, you know, raised up greens a lot of places, you know, little creeks meandering through the property, mature trees surrounding a very nice track. Uh, they've got some cool things planned uh, for this year throughout the whole year. And one of those things is, uh, is a little tournament uh, featuring, um, uh, you know, golfers dressed in period costume playing hickory golf clubs uh, that's uh, being uh, put on by the uh, uh, Golf Historical Society. And uh, it, what a cool thing to have happen for a 100th anniversary. But that's only a tip of the iceberg for some of the things that they're going to be doing. The whole story you can find at flagstick.com. So I do encourage you to go there and check out that story. Um, and you'll find it all the other little things that are going to be going on at the Gang Golf Club over the uh, course of the 2021 season as they celebrate 100 years. Now, they are not the only golf course celebrating a big milestone this year. Bay of Quinty and the Trenton Golf Club are both hold, holding their 100th anniversary this year as well. And the Cornwall Golf Club, Golf and Country Club, um, is celebrating 125 years. So, there's more golf clubs uh, celebrating big milestones this year. We don't have all the details on anything that those golf clubs are going to be doing just yet. But when we have that information, we'll pass it on to you or you'll find it at flagstick.com. One way or the other, we'll get that info out to you. Now, there's a golf course. There's golf courses, uh, you know, across the entire region that uh, have uh, achieved certain milestones, whether they're 25, 30, 35, 40, 50, 75 years. Um, We've got a full list of all of those. Uh, I'm going to be sharing information about those golf clubs with you throughout the season on this on 613 Golfer podcast and also uh, at, on flagstick.com and in the pages of the digital edition of Flagstick magazine. So we're going to keep you informed. That's what we do. That's what we do. Like I said before, like I said in the very first episode, if it happens in the 613, we're going to let you know about it right here on this podcast. And I guarantee you'll find it on flagstick.com. Well, as we uh, as we skip through this uh, this podcast, um, and as always, we try to have uh, some type of an interesting guest if we can. If not, you get to listen to me for 30, 35 minutes. And you know what? Well, maybe that's not a good thing. I think it's not a bad thing. But in this case, we do have a guest uh, this week on the podcast. And um, 
One of the things I think that uh, that a lot of us, you know, we, we look at, do we like the rules? Do we not like the rules? We watch golf on TV. We see how sometimes PGA Tour players are, uh, are greatly affected in the outcome of a tournament by the rules, whether it's Dustin Johnson, play, you know, grounding his club and what he thought wasn't a bunker uh, at uh, Whistling Straits and ending up uh, losing the tournament because of, uh, because of that uh, penalty. Uh, or, you know, Craig Stadler kneeling on a towel, uh, you know, thinking he's just keeping his pants clean and in actual fact, he's improving his, uh, his stance. You know, things like that, moving a stone in a, in a creek. Uh, you know, it's, the rules are there to protect you and the rules are there to protect the field. So sometimes there's an advantage, sometimes there's a disadvantage. It's a difficult and it's a tireless job um, for one to take on uh, to become a, you know, a Golf Canada referee or a PGA Tour uh, referee or a rules official, whatever, whatever we wanna call them. Um, you know, there are a lot of the times things that they do are behind the scenes. Um, a lot of times things that they say uh, affect people in a negative way and make, makes their round worse. And they're not too happy with them. But then sometimes those decisions go in the favor of the of the player, and they actually would love to just reach out and hug a, a rules official or or a referee, um, you know, for the ruling that they were given. Either way, tournaments need rules officials or referees, and um, we just happen to have one that works with us with all of our flagstick events and has worked with us with those since the very first flagstick event that we've ever ran. He also happens to be a very good friend of mine. He also happens to be the author, author of rule book um, on the uh, inside back page of every digital edition of flagstick magazine and, um, and posted online on flagstick.com. He happens to be Rich McLean. And when we come back from a break, uh, we're going to sit down with Rich and we're going to find out a little bit more about Rich and a lot more about the rules and why in the world would you want to become a rules official? All that, when we get back, stay with us, don't go away. At Ping, our culture of curiosity has been driving innovations for over 60 years. Innovations like the new G425 iron, which brings you greater distance without sacrificing the forgiveness and control you need to play with precision. And with free access to the Arcos Caddy system, you'll play smarter and shoot lower scores. The new Ping G425 iron, better by every measure. Get fit today. Visit ca.ping.com to learn more about G425. As promised, I'm here with uh, my good friend and uh, Golf Canada referee, um, Rich McLean. How are you, Rich? Doing well, doing well. Uh, you know, just getting up to speed like everyone else with the uh, the delayed start to the golf season. So uh, yeah, we're doing well. It's, it's awesome. harder than heck. Oh, isn't it though? I talked about that right off the top of the show about you know those people that uh, that don't like humidity probably aren't golfing much right now because no. uh, you know the level of humidity out there right now is uh, it's enough to make my hair go a little frizzy. Yours too, yeah. obviously. Yeah, what I have left of it. Yeah. <laughs> Now, Rich, you and I have known each other for a very long time, uh, not quite as long as you, you've known uh, Scott, Scott McLeod we're speaking of, um, but we've known each other long time. As long as I can remember, you, you were a golf guy. We, we, we golfed together back in the days of, uh, of Golfer's Choice and uh, Elm Avenue, I believe it was. Uh, yeah, Elm um... Geez, now you got me. Was it? It wasn't Elm Street because it was. Uh, it yeah. wasn't exactly the same as the Nightmare in Elm Street, but it I think was it, pretty close, though. It I was think it was Elm, close. yeah, yeah, Elmwood or something, yeah, yeah. But that was, uh, yeah, back when you were uh, just starting the magazine and uh, coming into Golfer's Choice with the uh, the monthly issues and. Uh, yeah, those ages. Uh, con congratulations, by the way, twenty five oh. years, man. That's awesome. Thank you, thank you. Well, I mean, you've. Uh, for quite a few of those years, uh, Rich, you've been you've been a part of of uh, what we're doing here. I mean, uh, you know, not necessarily with the the articles uh, that you write for the magazine, probably in the last four or five years, but uh, with the tournaments. The tournaments have going, been going on for uh, eight to ten years now, I think longer. Uh, if we go all the way back to the days of the Smuggler Shootout at Smuggler's Glen, I mean, it's it's been a while. So you've been along for a good chunk of that ride, my friend. Yeah, it's been fun. Uh, you know, we've got a, a really good player base, a pretty consistent bunch of guys that come out. And then seems like we get more and more guys just signing up every year and wait lists all the time. And 
super popular. You know, you uh, we we do a we all try and do a really good job to give them a really super experience, and I think we've succeeded at that, and the, the popularity has just grown. So it's been a lot of fun. Yeah, for sure. Now, you uh, we talked right before we came on uh, on the air here with the show that um, you're a, a golf affair. Uh, I call a rules official, so I can't get away from it. It's I golf it. referee rules <laughs> official, but. Uh, um, if we go back and I don't want to, you know, I don't want to go back to go back to, you know, Rich, when you were a boy, what were you doing that might have sparked you to become a rules official? But um, you did have some refereeing uh, experience that started before before golf um, in in the hockey realm. Um, tell me a little bit about that before we get into too much else. Yeah, I got into to minor hockey and um, first started off, I guess, in the, in the Toronto area, Mississauga. I got involved with uh, a friend of my cousins down there who were, you know, big hockey family and uh, got involved that way, started doing minor hockey, uh, worked my way up, uh, moved to Kingston, did some, uh, you know, worked my way up to major midget and then midget triple A and all that stuff. And I was refereeing there and I did some, uh, the lines in uh, junior A, junior B, you know, sort of tier two A. So not OHL, but worked my way up that way. And, uh, did that on and off. Well, not on and off, pretty much on steadily for 10 solid years. Uh, there was a stretch there, probably seven or eight years where I felt like I didn't take my skates off because I did summer hockey tournaments every year. So uh, yeah, it was, it was a real good experience. And then it was one of those things where I just kind of got to the end of it and thought, okay, maybe I'll uh, try something else. And uh you know, it, it kind of sat in the sat on the sidelines for a while. I did some baseball. Uh, I umpired a lot of baseball, senior ball down in Kingston for a while, um, softball. Uh, so I've always sort of been involved in that side of sports, uh, the rules side of things. So when uh, that opportunity came up in golf, because I'd been involved in golf for God, now it's got to be forty five years since I've been playing. Um, it just kind of dovetailed into that. There was a small uh, sort of casual amateur stable for tour here in Ottawa that I got involved in and I got involved in the rules of that organization that way. And then it just kind of uh, exploded into me getting involved in the rules with OVGA and then uh, into uh, the provincial associations, uh, mainly through Golf Quebec and then uh, uh, into Golf Canada. And that's, uh, that's where I am right now. <laughs> There's, you got We got to We got to take a step back. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, obviously, um, you know, being someone that refereed hockey, and you know, you said you dabbled in in uh, umpiring baseball as well. Um, what? What's the wiring there? <laughs> to to I mean, because we're we're talking about like like understand. And hockey is one thing. Hockey is probably when it comes to the officiating abuse. Sure. Um, it's up here. Um, yeah. Baseball is probably, you know, here. Mm -hmm. Golf is kind of more of a silent abuse. <laughs> like, yeah. like, are you a sucker for punishment, Rich? <laughs> well, no, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't say I'm a sucker for punishment, but I'd like to see things done right. And I'd like to see, th I'd like to see sports played fairly. You know, I, uh, I like to see winners decided within the rules and, I'm not going to say cheating, but improper play bothers me. Yeah. So uh, there's that. Um, but yeah, I've, I've, I've always been sort of drawn to the technical side of things. I was always pretty proficient at sports, you know, nothing spectacular. I could always, you know, figure out my way around the ball diamond or around the, around the rink. But, you know, from, from the real side of thing, I was always sort of enamored with the, uh, the concept of fair play and, uh, you know, as, as level a playing field as possible for all the competitors. So it's, it's, that's what kind of drove me. Now you're, you're also a bit of a, like, um, I would say you're a bit of a student of the game as well. Like it's not just, uh, you know, it's not just the rules that draw you in. Um, you're, you're into the equipment side of things. Like you, you pay very close attention to the technical side because you mentioned the technical side of things. And, and I, I mean, I can recall when I, when I worked, uh, with Scott and, uh, and Jim at the, the golf shop golfers choice in Kingston for all those years, I can remember, you know, you coming in, you like to regrip your own clubs and, mm -hmm. you know, you like to tinker with your shafts and, and you're, you know, you were on the, uh, on the Mitchell Loft lie machine there, do it. You know, I mean, you were into that yeah. kind of stuff and you keep 
like is that is that part of the makeup i guess that makes for you at least to, that draws you into um the officiating side too is just that uh, that that deep interest in the game yeah absolutely um i've i've always had a romantic connection to the game as i think a lot of players do there's always that when you talk to golf uh I guess golf purists or those of us who have been around the game for a long, long time, there's always that sort of romantic connection to it. So, and then a lot of us sort of get into that technical side of thing and, and long for the understanding of, you know, like teacher or like, like a professional does or a, a teaching pro does, sorry, that gets into ball flight and that type of me mechanical side of the game. So I, I wouldn't say I'm, I'm into that sort of, way into that technical side of thing but i'm more of a tinkerer i'm more more curious as to how things work and the rules kind of fit that too as you know um, i like to understand how the rules get applied how they work um within the entire framework you know and i i'd love to get into these conversations with guys about um what they think is fair and what's not fair and you know why did we do this and you know, why can't we do this? And I, I try to sort of help players understand, you know, the, the way, the way, the, the way to view it, you know, is from a, from a more uh, holistic and technical, not necessarily a technical view. I don't want to bore them to death, but just sort of give them a, a bit of a background and say, you know, we do it, we do it this way because, you know, there's a reason for these things. And that, that, that stuff kind of, you know, pulls me along. This, that's what interests me. Now, this isn't something um, for people listening, or people watching on YouTube. This isn't something that um, you just wake up one day and say, yeah, I'm going to be a rules official. And you go online and you, you, uh, you, there's a test and you say, click here to get your officiating license. And you click a button and you write a 50 word multiple choice question. And at the end, there's a thing that flashes up on the screen. It says, congratulations, your certificate will be mailed to you. This is not this is a process, right? Like this is a, this is a truly a really deep uh, process. Tell us a little bit about, cause you're, you're at a very high level. Um, so tell us a little bit about the process that is required to get to the level that you might be at. Well, there's a, there's a lot of studying involved. Um, there's a lot of, as you, as you get uh, higher uh, to, to higher levels, there's a lot more study involved. There's a, you get a lot more in depth into uh, the way the rules operate um there's a lot of practical work involved uh the higher you get the more practical hours you have to attain in order to get certified so uh, you're spending time with a lot of your peers on golf courses you're spending time with a lot of your peers away from the golf course and in, in study groups and getting prepared for exams um good friend of ours jerry bauer runs a uh a, a a weekly study group through the winter on uh, on Zoom, and he goes through the rule the entire rule book section by section with the students in order to prepare them for taking their next level exams or just getting to that next level of understanding. So there is a lot of a lot of care and a lot of study that goes on behind the scenes. So uh, yeah, it's it's a lot of work, but it's a, as we call it a labor of love, right? You know, because we we like to give our time back to the game that way. And, now it's uh, not just about um, it's not just about the rules either, is it, Rich? It's not just about uh, you know you got you can drop there, you your ball cross there, you got to do this. Um, one of the things I think for me, uh, you know, I'm not. I, I said at the beginning of the show, I'm I'm not a I'm not a rules guy. I have no inclination to get that deep into it. I follow them as best I can when I'm out playing and stuff like that, but. One of the things that I've witnessed over the years that you've been uh, the head referee for uh, for all of our events is the pre-tournament work that goes into just it's not and it's not just about course setup per se, but the pre-tournament work that goes into to getting things ready for the day that the first person puts the peg in the ground and away you go. Um, tell us a little bit about. Um, if I were, you know, if it were a day in the life of kind of thing, um, you know, tell me a little bit about that process of just perfect example. The flagstick open is coming up on June 26th, 27th of this month, and you've already been in contact with 
uh, Chris Follett at Equinel and Scott McEnroy at Equinel. And you're already planning to go out to start the pre-setup setup. Uh, so tell us about the process to get to June 26th. Yeah, um, you know, as a lot of your listeners know, we do play the same course year, year on year, at least for the last while we've been stationed at Equinox. That being said, the golf course is still a, a living operation. So things change from year to year. So you have to go out and do your recon, check the course over, talk to your, your GMs and your, and your uh, superintendents and find out what's changed. Um, just get the lay of the land ahead of time. So you kind of know what you're going to be dealing with. And then you're going to look at setting up possible local rules that are going to be unique to that setup that may not be uh, common to another course. So it, it's, it's different in that way because every course is different. Even the same course can be different from day to day, depending on the conditions. So you sort of have to do your, your due diligence ahead of time so that you're aware of what the course is going to be like. You can communicate that to the players before they even hit the course. And then you're ready and your team is ready to deal with anything that might come up because they know ahead of time, Hey, you know, we've got a little bit of a ground and repair situation here or, you know, just, just things that might be out of the ordinary. Maybe the, the conditions are super wet. So maybe we have to play, you know, Mark Lift Clean Place. Uh, maybe the conditions are super dry. So you're going to see a lot of balls roll out that might get into a, a, a difficult situation that you wouldn't see. So it's just, it's just, yeah, there's a lot of that, those hours in, uh, in preparation ahead of time. And I mean, for our tournament, it's, it's a drop in the bucket compared to, you know, what even happens on a national level or at the professional level with the uh, PGA Tour and the LPGA. I mean, I, th I think a lot of people would be really amazed at the, the amount of work that goes into setting up a tournament months and months in advance, just so that the players are literally ready to hit the ground running. Yeah. Yeah. Now you spend, I mean, <laughs> jokingly, the email that flew around there the other day, <laughs> Uh, referring to the quantity of red paint uh, that you will require. I mean, that's one of the things that um, I think anybody that plays Equinel between now and June 26th um, and then shows up to play in the tournament will obviously see a pretty massive difference in um, optically uh, what they see from the standpoint of hazard lines and things like that. Tell, tell me a little bit, of, tell us a little bit about that side of setup that is, you know, extremely time consuming for you. Yeah. Um, yeah. That's uh, the joke that I made uh, to Chris in the email saying, you know, I need my usual, uh, what was it? 3000 gallons of red paint is, uh, <laughs> is, is pretty close to accurate, especially with the rules changes as uh, uh, you know, starting 2019 where uh, you know, you can designate areas to be penalty areas now that didn't, that didn't necessarily have water in them. Like they used to be, they, you know, used to be the old water hazards. And then everything else was kind of as you found it, unless you marked it as ground under repair. Now you can designate a lot more areas with red lines and red stakes so that players can get that, that penalty stroke relief as opposed to having a lost ball and going back. So there's a lot more of that prep work involved in painting these red lines and yellow lines and, and white lines. Uh, but again, it's, it's, uh, it's all part of the, uh, you know, each, each course is set up. Um, and Equinel is a, is a huge challenge in that respect. Uh, Smuggler's Glen, as we know yeah. from experience, was a, is a huge challenge as well. So, uh, and I, I've, I had meetings last year with, uh, with Jason. I went down there for a day um, and uh, Jason Boyce, the GM, and went down there for a day and he wanted me to consult on, you know, setting up different, pen, uh, you know, different penalty areas on his course, because that course is just loaded with uh, groves of huge trees everywhere. Yeah. So, well, that was always the joke too at, uh, at Smuggler's Glen, right? Was uh, when we, we had the shootout there is that all of the rules officials, referees, um, would, uh, <laughs> I'm never going to get over that. But so it should it be is a drinking game. Exactly. Oh my God. Can you <laughs> not be in trouble? No, <laughs> no. But that was always, uh, it wasn't so much a joke. It was, it was serious. Is it that coming down as a rookie official, 
and and working that event um, that weekend was like a training ground because of the number of I mean you guys were nonstop rulings there because of just how how vast that golf course um, is and and the different areas that it you know whether it was hazards whether it was environmental areas whether it was the cart paths running through rock cuts and, and like it's just mm-hmm. constant amount of stuff and and uh, Equinel's not as bad as that uh, but Smugglers was always that uh, you know it's like a training ground for you guys right yeah very much so it's a it's a very technical golf course um, if you get off the off the main part of the fairway there's a lot of trouble there's a lot of different relief situations that an official or a referee can come across there and they're going to have to help out players you know with point of entry and you know did the did the ball cross here where am i going to drop uh am i going to drop on a cart path and then to get off the cart path i'm going to have to take another bit of relief too so yeah there's a lot of technical aspects to that golf course that uh it's it's a great training ground for any uh, any upcoming official that wants to uh, to get some work in for sure. Now, as a rules um, official slash uh, Golf Canada referee, um, you've worked at a lot of events, not just ours, uh, whether they be OVGA, Golf Quebec, um, you know, local events, what have you. Um, anything that you can share with uh, with our viewers uh, and listeners. Um, stories that uh, unique rulings uh, comical or otherwise that uh, (laughs) that would be of interest I mean it's got to be something well there was one actually one year uh, this involves a a course setup and uh, sort of reconnaissance type of thing at Smuggler's Glen and uh, there was a year where it was particularly wet in the spring and it does tend to be wet down there Um, and when we were playing in May I think it was May or even April, maybe. No, yeah, it was May. It was May. Yeah, it was, was May. And it was yeah. it was always it always seemed to be a little bit behind down there as far as the weather. We'd always run into something like the one year we had a hail delay. I think that <laughs> yeah, was exactly. I do remember that we had that well, the four crazy. seasons of golf. Yeah, yeah, that was yeah, and then it got super hot right after that. So, but there was a there was a year when uh, one of the folks on my team was uh, driving around a hole, and we we make a point of sticking to the rough areas. We don't want to drive on the playing surfaces as much as possible because we don't want to disturb them for the players that are going to be playing. So we stick to the rough areas and there was this one rough area. I think it's in front of the, I'm going to say the 15th T there. There's that sort of elevated area. And then you go over a little bit of a rock cut down to a lower yep. part just before the fairway. And there's a section, I guess about 20, 20 yards long of rough between that rock cut and the edge of the fairway and it was really soft so one of my team was driving their cart through there and they got stuck (laughs) the cart just just all four wheels just sort of went in about seven seven or eight inches couldn't get out so another one of our uh, our team this uh, uh, a lot of people in this area would know him because he now works on the pga tour champions but um he uh, (laughs) came in and decided to do the shovel wrist thing and try and help push this cart out uh, so we put in all, put on all his rain gear and course and pushing away, pushing away on this cart. And I guess he pushed so hard at one point that the cart just decided to release forward. The tires were spinning. He falls on his face and he gets up and he's got this big muddy skunk stripe all the way up his front from the tire spray. So, you know, it's those kind of things that, uh, that happened behind the scenes. There was another time at a national championship where, um, uh, a very, uh, very well-respected national rules official or referee at the uh, rules official at the time had uh, gone through one of these sort of maintenance paths between holes. The maintenance path was kind of uh, elevated, built up uh, gravel. And uh, on the sides, there was trees, heavy trees, and then it dro- kind of dropped off into a little tiny bit of a ravine on each side. Uh, the official gets called back to go back in the other direction instead of going through the cut through and then turning around and coming back decides to try and do a three point turn gets through two points of the turn and backs the cart down into this ravine. So the cart's now stuck. And, you know, these are, these are weird things that happen behind the scenes. Even when, when play is going on, the players have no idea that's happening. What about uh, Rich? What about some rulings that you might've come across, uh, 
you know, over the course of uh, the years, I know, I know, I know there's got to be some flags that open uh, um, uh, stories uh, or, or even, you know, from the days of the, uh, the shootout flags that shoot out at smugglers, there's got to be some stories there, but uh, what, what do you well, got? Our good friend, uh, Scott McLeod um, <laughs> doing his. Sorry, uh, Scott. I, brought, <laughs> I baited him on this one. He's um, he was doing his PAT for his class A. And uh, he hit a tee shot on number one at Equinel. And for those who played there, it's a, it's a forced carry over a huge pond. Uh, and then you've got to try and clear some bunkers on the other side. And always on the far end of the pond, there's always a stand of reeds or something. So it's very hard to see if the ball is cleared or not. So Scott hits his tee shot. Looks like it might have cleared the other side, possibly bounced on the other side and gone back in. So if that were the case, then he's going to try and drop on the other side. I was pretty darn sure the ball never got across. I wasn't in the area to be able to stop him. And I saw him go up around the other side and saw him getting ready to take a drop on the far side of the pond. When in fact, he should have taken his drop on the near side of the pond because your point of reference is the point where the ball last crossed the margin of this penalty area. So I'm running and yelling at the top of my lungs, Scott, Scott, stop. <laughs> And he's looking around and he finally sees me and I'm, and then he looks at it and you can see the light go on <laughs> over his head. And he's like, oh yeah, I don't think that cleared the other side of the penalty area, the hazard. So he had to come all the way back to the drop area and, and drop from there. But I saved him, you know, at least two strokes. And I believe he ended up getting his PAT number by one. Yeah, I, so I think, was, yeah, I, I think it was one. That. I think it was one, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so, so he has thankful uh, after the round. He'd be, yeah. So <laughs> I guess so. Now there was another, like, okay. Um, there was another ruling that, that was made that resulted in a, one of the um, probably the most significantly um, I should say well-known, but since we're just flagstick and it's the flagstick open, it's not, it's not that well-known, but there was an incident regarding, I believe a log. Uh, oh, in yeah. the woods. Okay. <laughs> I'm going to let you tell the story because from an officiating point of view, someone made the ruling and then the player involved took every bit of that ruling to their advantage, but it <laughs> didn't sure. really result in, uh, in some being to their advantage, I think. No. And that Jerry Bauer was involved in the initial part of this ruling. And that was to the right of the 13th green uh, par, uh, par three at Equinel, and there's a, a the grove of trees there, and there was a dead log. And one of the players had pushed a tee shot into this area of trees, a little short of pin high. They go in, they start looking for the ball, which is just fine. And then I think it was the caddy saw this sort of rotted log and decided to sort of pick it up and throw it out of the way. But as soon as he did, uh, he uncovered a huge wasp's nest and it was like game on. All of a sudden you see these two guys just come running out of the woods and they're being, you know, tailed by, a, a, looked like a million wasps and they're being stung. And so we had to stop play for a while and uh, figure out, first of all, if anybody was, anyone was allergic, um, you know, if anyone needed a medical attention. So it was a little serious for a while. Uh, but uh, yeah, it was just kind of, and you're, you're in a spot there where 13th and 16th tees kind of come together. The 15th or the 14th green is not too far away. You've got 17 on the other side. So there's a, there's a whole area where a lot of people can come through and see what's going on. So yeah. everybody just kind of stopped and kind of watched the, the fun unfold <laughs> at these two guys. <laughs> not so much the fun player, for them at the time. No, but... no, but the player and then the caddy carrying the clubs as they come bolting out of the woods screaming. And then, um, so we, we, we took that area out of play, basically gave uh, the players uh, the opportunity to take relief from a dangerous situation uh, outside the tree line in order to keep them away from the wasps. The, funnier, the funniest part of that was at the end when the caddy decided, okay, it's probably okay. I can go back in there and, and try and find my player's ball after the player had already continued on. And he still got stung again, and, you know, and, and Jerry's just shaking his head. He's <laughs> right, a sucker like, for what punishment. Are you going back in, why are you going back in there? It's a $3 golf ball, you know, but this guy <laughs> wanted to go back in and get the ball, and he got lit up again. Yeah. Oh, so. my gosh. Now, 
Um, obviously, we've talked about you officiating, uh, you know, uh, doing the head uh, officiating duties with the, the Flagstick Open and the other Flagstick events that we've, we've done. What other significant events, uh, Rich, have you officiated at that, um, I mean, considered a fish, uh, you know, um, significant events? Like, what other events have you done other than the ones with us? Uh, I've been involved in uh, the Alexander Tunis event a number of times, uh, which is the uh, one of the two uh, Quebec major tournaments that's uh, usually played here in the Ottawa region. Uh, I've been involved in a couple of national championships. I'm very fortunate to, to be involved in uh, a couple, uh, one at Camelot, uh, one at Hunt, or sorry, at uh, Royal Ottawa. Uh, so uh, it's it's been fun so far. Um, from uh, I haven't done as, as many national events because I'm still uh, I still have a day job, so it's uh, <laughs> what it's a little <laughs> harder to get around. Yeah, but um, no, I've been, I've been pretty fortunate to uh, to not only work at those events but also work with some really phenomenal officials. A lot of people that I look up to, um, Dean Ryan, one of them, yeah. the, the the aforementioned. Uh, muddy skunk stripe that was that was him getting painted by the cart um great mentor uh jerry bauer uh gail faulkner gene stone sega uh, you know a lot of people that are very highly respected very highly placed have done a lot of work in a lot of big tournaments and have studied you know at, at uh st andrews and, and what have you so i've i've been very fortunate to have a lot of support and getting a lot of knowledge from them um, so yeah, I, you know, it's, it's been fun, it's been a lot, a lot of fun and a lot of fun to work with these people. Now, speaking of fun, I'm going to shift gears a little bit here. Now we've been talking about rules and we've been talking about the, the path and the journey to, uh, to becoming, uh, you know, um, a, a referee within, within golf Canada. Um, I want to talk about Las Vegas. Okay. Um, I want to talk about the uh, uh, last week uh, on on this uh, the six one three golfer podcast, I had Scott and Joe on, and um, we did a roundtable discussion about just about everything that we could we could jam into. I say jam into is a two and a half hour podcast, um, but uh, whatever we could jam in information about stories and stuff from the last twenty five years. Um, and obviously we couldn't possibly talk about everything. And, uh, um, I would be remiss if I did not with you on this podcast, bring up one particular, <laughs> uh, trip that Scott and I took down to Arizona and, uh, to meet up with you and cause you have a place, uh, you and, and your, uh, your wife have a, a place in, um, uh, in Arizona, it's in, you're in Tulsa though, right? Or, um, not no, Tulsa, Tucson. Uh, Tucson. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we were coming down, we we're going to play some golf. Uh, we we're going to go down and stay at your place for a little bit, play some golf. And, uh, and we had it all planned out. The first part of that trip happened. And, uh, and then what happened, Rich? <laughs> well, that was the day we played, I think at Greyhawk. Yeah. And we were sitting in, uh, in the grill room. And we were getting ready to sort of make the track down from uh, Phoenix down to my place, uh, our place down just south of Tucson and play some golf around that area. And we're having lunch after the round and we look up at the TV and there's this news flash and the highway's closed because there's a major dust storm and there's like a 50 car pileup on the I-10. So we're like, um, what are we gonna do? So we sat around and talked about it for a while. And uh, I think we sort of uh, adjourned back to our rooms or something. And then we came up with this brilliant idea to, uh, hey, you know, the, the World Long Drive Championships happening just over in Las Vegas uh, this weekend. I think the finals are tomorrow. What are the odds uh, we can, uh, you know, do an audible and head over there? And Scott got onto uh, his contacts in the, in the media and grabbed us some press passes and uh yeah we just we hit the road the next day had a great drive through the desert uh, you know down across uh, hoover dam and 
basically showed up at the, it was at the uh, Vegas Motor Speedway that year, the way they had yeah. set it up where you were hitting from the uh, setup up in the stands and down into the infield on the, onto the grid painted on the infield. And we were sitting there sort of front, uh, literally front row center to watch. Frozen, the, mind you, frozen. It was cold. Yeah, it oh, was cold. Man. It was cold. But to see, you know, the longest male hitters on the planet, actually even the women were there too to watch the longest hitters on the planet launch it off this platform. And uh, yeah, we went down, we had uh, a great time at the, at the event, got to see some big boys hit some bombs, uh, stayed up all night and got ourselves <laughs> out. Where, where did we get, where do we get our room at? Uh, uh, we were at the oh, pyra um, the, the pyramid uh, uh, hotel there. Um, Lux yeah. Luxor. Luxor. Yeah. yeah. That's right. And we actually yeah, got, I, I, I distinctly remember that Scott booked the rooms. Yeah. We, we we parked the van because we had to get to the to the venue for the uh, for the uh, long drive championship. We had to drive there. We actually parked the van on the little ramp coming in and uh, and paid um, the parking lot guy a few bucks to let us leave the van there. We went in and there was a lineup. Scott yeah. booked the hotel rooms on his phone while That's we were right. in the lineup. I remember and that. that and then we were, doing these rooms. And, exactly. And then we were able to go over and check in at the rapid checkout because we'd already booked our rooms, right? Yeah. So we, yeah, we, we left we this big long lineup, on. went yeah, and we checked got, into our rooms. We got a disgustingly good rate too. I think it was oh, like it was 40, insane. 45 bucks. Yeah, it was insane at what we, yeah, what we was, paid. Threw yeah, our stuff in the room. Dumped our stuff, yeah. And yeah. We took off, headed over to Vegas Speedway. And of course, we're we're I mean, we're packed to go on a trip to Arizona. Yeah. So, you know, we knew that at, at times, you know, the evenings in the desert were, were going to be chillier, but we didn't really plan on spending any time outside at night, you know, other than maybe sitting. I think Scott and I hung around at the uh, one resort we were at. We hung around a big, huge fire pit with the rest of the guests at night. So, I mean, it was it was sort of planned. You're going to be warm, but yeah. we weren't really planning for that. We weren't really dressed for that. And it was I do, I remember it was freaking cold. And yeah. uh, it was cool uh, to see the event and everything, but it was it was cool there as well. It was freezing cold, and I yeah, couldn't wait to, to the, go back. When you get to the point where you think you want to share the jacket with your buddy sitting <laughs> next to you, you know it's chilly. I mean, we had our polar fleece pullovers on. You're still wearing shorts, though, and I mean, our legs were freezing. Yeah, yeah. But, but what it was crowd, once the crowd got going and everything you know you kind of warm up to that and it was it was a blast it was really fun well it certainly wasn't the first time that scott and i have pulled a, an audible uh on a road trip or um and i i once again i said i'm gonna we're gonna scott and i are gonna come on another episode of the podcast some other time during the year and we're gonna talk about road trips um and uh because there are there are some stories to share uh, many road trips over the years, but that was one that I wanted to kind of dig into a little bit because, you know, having you on the podcast this week and, and the fact that you were there with us when all this happens was kind of like, let's take a little 25, 25th anniversary trip down memory lane with the, uh, yeah. with Rich and see how much of this he remembers. But, you know, you don't forget, oh, you don't you forget know, uh, stuff like that. You don't, you, you know, just that don't. Was, that was clear as a bell. That whole experience was awesome. You know, you guys invited me along on your, on this fam and uh you know just the experience to go to camelback and, and and play some of these golf courses and and eat some of that food i mean i remember that one night we were in the restaurant and the chef just kept coming out and bringing us food we were, <laughs> i do we remember were that so yeah. full we were now, so full but it was all so good there was uh sorry to do this to you rich but there was another incident um involving you on that very road trip as well uh, we were at the, uh, um, oh my God, what was the name of the golf course? See, this is where Scott is great at this, because you remember, but it, it features the Wicked Six. Yeah, uh, the last six holes, yeah. Yes, yeah. and um, and you were behind the green on one of these holes, and uh, damned if you didn't get a little too close to a jumping choy. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, it was weird, too, because I, I, I the stuff, it's like Velcro. Yes. But it's like the worst Velcro you could ever feel in your life because it's like cross between a Velcro and porcupine. Yes. And it was like a, a small avocado sized piece of this uh, cactus that had, I guess, maybe somehow just sort of clicked onto the back of my shoe and then flipped up and buried itself in the back of my left calf. 
And I just remember and looking it was down going, oh, yeah. I just remember looking down going, oh, that's interesting. <laughs> and then the pain <laughs> set in. It's like, oh, my God. And then you guys. How many towels did we have? Oh, man. I we had to have like six or seven layers of towels yeah, wrapped around this thing the to pull it. the spines were poking through the yeah. towel, too. And you guys were literally pulling these things out of my leg. Yes, and, and laughing our asses it, off at the same yeah, time. Oh, of course, yeah. <laughs> and it was funny, too, because at the time, it didn't really hurt that much. And then until got all the stuff out of my leg, and then you feel it start to throb. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, this is going to hurt. <laughs> so here you are <laughs> play, playing these golf courses out in the desert with all these signs around saying, beware of rattlesnakes and, and all this yeah. stuff. And uh, rattlesnake, we didn't even see one. Um, and the only thing that happened was uh, was a cactus jumped up and bit you in the back of the leg. Yeah, I get attacked by a jumping choya. Yeah, yeah, that was uh, that was pretty wild, and uh, it took a long time for those the little scars to disappear. Off the oh, I can believe it. Took it. a couple of years. Yeah, but hmm. uh, yeah, I mean, it's all part of the experience. It's all part of playing golf in the desert, and uh, you know, getting to getting to see different parts of the world. And that's I think where you guys have done a really good job too. Is you you give your readers these experiences from different parts of the world, whether you're over in you know Scotland or England or or coming back here and doing all the traveling you guys have done in the states, and just really giving the reader a really rich experience through your eyes and making these readers come back to you with feedback saying, "Wow, that sounds like an awesome trip. I think I'm going to go check this out." You know, so it's been a lot of fun to be part, at least a little part of that. Uh, yeah. And we've yeah. tried to involve, uh, you know, people like yourself, uh, you know, our good buddy, Mike uh, Rowden was involved in one of the ones we did to Mississippi, Tony Harris, uh, you know, a very well-known golf uh, um, artist, painter. Uh, he was involved in one that we did in, um, in uh, Jacksonville, uh, where we, we actually uh, played TPC Sawgrass uh, with him. Um, you know, there's been so many experiences and that's why I say like, there's a, there's a whole, there's a whole podcast just on, you know, to be, dis to, to, to have just on some of the trips we've taken. Stories. And, oh my gosh. Yeah. And, and we, and you kind of have to, we'd have to let our guard down a little bit, kind of like what we did here today is because we could have, could have talked about the golf courses and, sure. and how beautiful they were, but you know, people don't necessarily want to hear all that. <laughs> they want to hear some of that. They want to hear some of, they want to hear the stories and the, and, you know, you know, there's, uh, you know, so many more to be told. Um, I think for Scott and I, some of the most memorable, memorable or important ones that we've done probably are the ones that we've done in the last two or three years where we've, we haven't gone to the States um, and we haven't ventured out. We've stayed in Ontario or, or in Quebec and uh, stayed close to home and sort of showcased what's available to people that they could just jump in their car and go because we've done so many trips where we you know we fly down we spend nine ten days playing 10 30, 20, 12 rounds of golf in that time period you know two a days and you know it's um you know it's great to showcase that but not everybody can take those trips so uh it's been nice to do some that are a little bit more local and I think we're looking at probably trying to do something later this year, if we can, uh, that's more local as well, because we're obviously still not traveling quite the way we used to. So, but yeah, it was great that you were able to be a part of that trip. And I'm sure we'll try to get you on to be a part of some other ones, uh, some other ones later on. So um, what's next for you, Rich, as a, as a, as a rules guy? Um, you know, what, what do you want to, where do you want to see this go? Uh, you know, beyond what you're doing right now satisfied with what you're doing right now is there a, is there another goal upon retirement yeah um i think the work is work as much as i can in retirement uh you know the, uh, coming up uh, the end of this year actually uh, so um next season i'm hoping to be uh, involved here locally as much as possible um and then uh we'll see where it goes from there it's just putting in the time uh, having having the time to be able to put in the time is going to be important too, and uh, I think that's where it's going to start to really take off for me. Once I'm done with my uh, my nine to five, I can start concentrating on other things. Um, you know, help out within uh, a lot of great organizations that we have here uh, locally. You know, the OVGA does a lot of hard work. Uh, Golf Ontario does a lot of hard work. Uh, Golf Quebec, so. There's a lot of, uh, you know, once we get back to some sense of normality, there's a lot of great tournament golf to be played here. And there's a lot of 
a lot of need for uh, referees. So uh, I'm, I'm looking to be involved a lot more in that. Awesome. Awesome. Well, listen, Rich, I am uh, very thankful that you uh, were able to make some time to to sit and chat with me. Uh, it's all, it is always nice just to talk to you as it is, but uh, it's nice to talk about you as much as it is to talk to you. So thank you so much uh, for doing this. And um, uh, I'm looking forward to the end of the month. It should be a lot of fun uh, at the Open um, later this month uh, uh, and seeing you there. Yeah, fingers crossed for good weather. And, uh, and again, uh, congrats on 25 wonderful years of, uh, of Flagstick. You guys have done a fantastic job. Awesome. Thanks very much, Rich. We will talk to you soon. Take care. All right, buddy. Well, I'll tell you, thank you so much, Rich, for uh, for taking some time uh, and uh, spending some time with us on, on the 613 Golfer podcast. Um, it was really cool uh, to listen to some of the insight and uh, and uh, whatnot on the rules and how, you know, becoming a rules official and, and what's all involved in that. I think most people probably have no idea um, just how... Uh, how involved uh, a role that is to play. Uh, not one for me, I'll tell you that. I mean, I'm, I'm appreciative of the rules. I'm certainly one that follows the rules and I'm, I'm you know, but nah, I don't have thick enough skin to be able to tell somebody that you're getting penalized to shot for slow play or, um, you know, you shouldn't have dropped there. Or you should have dropped there here and you shouldn't have done that. I just, I couldn't, nope, not me. So good on you guys, Rich, and, and, and all the other uh, referees and rules officials out there that, uh, you know, especially those that work our events. Uh, I know what's involved. I've seen it uh, firsthand. So thank you for that. Well, it's that time in the show where uh, we try to help you with your golf game. Um, I'm hoping that uh, over the course of the last uh, 12 episodes of 613 Golfer that you've picked a little something up from some of the tips that Kevin has uh, provided to you. Uh, and if you haven't, well, maybe you're like me and you're not even trying. Um, but I think, I think there's a lot there that you can, you can pick up. And um, this week, Kevin is going to uh, help us with our chipping. It's going to help us hit crisper chip shots, more spinning chip shots, uh, cool little drill that, uh, that he's got on this week's quick tip. So stay with us when we come back. We're going to head out to the lesson tee with Kevin, and uh, he's going to help us out with the chipping. Don't go away. At Ping, we're an engineering company. Success is measured in the lab and on your scorecard. We focus on results, your results. In the G425 Max driver, that means more time in the fairway, less time in the rough. It means longer drives, shorter approach shots, and fewer putts. The new G425 drivers, taking MOI to the max. Get fit today. Visit ca.ping.com to learn more about G425. Well, we're back. And as promised, we're going to head right to the lesson tee. And we're going to figure out, from what Kevin says, how to hit crisper, more spinning chip shots. Today's quick tip is on chipping. I'm out on my... Uh... My short game complex at the Kevin Haim Golf Center here, and I'm going to use this alignment stick to help me chip the ball better. And how am I going to do that? Really simple. So many newer players that I either work with or give clinics to, they feel it's their job to scoop, and they almost fall backwards a little bit trying to lift that golf ball, and so they chunk it, they flub it, they skull it, all kinds of bad things happen. Next time you're practicing, here's a great little drill for you. Put your alignment stick about three inches behind your golf ball and then a little bit of weight forward, a little bit of hands forward like you're supposed to do with a chip shot and just make sure that you don't hit that alignment stick when you're chipping. Of course it's Pavlovian, you've got a little encouragement to not do it. If you do it poorly it's going to look something like this, it's not going to work at all. So. It's a great little tip for you. I hope it helps with your chipping. Next time you're out here at the Kevin Haim Golf Center working on your short game, give it a try. Well, I don't know about you, but that makes total sense to me. Total sense. It seems so simple. And a lot of golf instruction is, uh, seems very simple, but it's repetitive. And I think any golf pro, I'm not one, but any golf professional that, that teaches golf will tell you that Whatever drills they give you, whatever tips they give you to do on these little quick tips that we do, it's all about repetition and practicing the proper way. So even if you're in your backyard working on your chip shot, you can take a golf club 
and lay it down on the ground instead of an alignment stick. If you don't have an alignment stick, you could take a twig of a tree and put it down on the ground and do the same thing. As long as you're practicing that repetitive motion, then your muscle memory starts to, to, to kick in and it becomes second nature when you take it to the course. Because obviously when you're on the practice tee or you're in your backyard doing it, you're putting something down on the ground. Can't do that when you're playing around a golf or Rich and the other rules officials will, will call you in violation or your buddies will because there's probably some money on the line. Um, but, you know, it's all repetition. So practice, practice, practice if you want things to go better for you on the golf course doesn't for me because I don't practice but anyway that is the way it is well that's all I got for this week um, I think I had enough last week that I've got probably could have sat out a few shows and, and just let that one stew for a while but hey there's stuff going on and on this podcast we need to make sure that that we keep you 613 golfers informed as to everything that's going on so Thanks very much for uh, for joining us this week. Thanks to uh, Kevin for another great tip. Thanks to Rich McLean for coming on and being a part of the show this week. Great little discussion, lots of insight, lots of information. Really happy that we could finally do that. Um, thanks to Ping uh, for being our sponsor this uh, this week. And like I said before, now that the pro shops and the retail stores are open, we can go in and we can see those golf clubs and hopefully touch them and sanitize our hands and touch those golf clubs and maybe test them out. I'm not sure exactly what you're going to be able to do in retail, but 15% 15 capacity means that you're going to be able to get in there and you're going to be able to see the stuff. If you can't get in there or you're still not comfortable going in there, ca.ping.com. Check out the entire G425 lineup of drivers, hybrids, fairway woods, and irons. It's all there. And thanks again to Ping for being our sponsor this week. Now, if you like this podcast and you want to watch more of this podcast or listen to more of this more of this podcast click the like button click the notification bell make sure that you get every single episode on youtube if you don't want to watch it on youtube well that's okay check it out on spotify and apple podcasts or make it really simple for you just go to flagstick.com click the podcast button on the menu at the top of the page and down comes every single episode we've ever done you can pick and choose the ones you want to watch and uh, there it is. So thanks very much. Have a great golfing week, everybody. And always remember, go for the stick.